have two presenters for this webinar, uh, one representative of Australia and one representative of the UK. Uh, the run of the, the events from here will be about uh, 30 minute presentations with each, as I said, with questions at the end. So our, and our first presentation will be uh, by James Guest. So James is a senior engineer working in AEMO's operational analysis and engineering team. During his time at AEMO, James has worked in grid and SCADA modelling, operations planning, national planning and congestion modelling. James has experience in power system modelling and real-time analysis, applications and systems. He is, has an interest in automation and has developed several decision-making tools currently in use across the organisation. Uh, Roisin, who will be our second presenter, is uh, the Assistant Technical Specialist in the Infrastructure and Strategy Team at Senex. Roisin has quite an interesting uh, professional background that started with a degree in astrophysics and has led her to a master's degree in sustainable engineering from the University of Nottingham. Uh, in her role at Senex, uh, Roisin supports government, local authorities and companies with information and insights they need to switch to electric vehicles. So uh, with that, James, I, uh, I might start to hand things over to you and just check that you are all good to go. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is James Guest uh, and today I'm going to be presenting on wide area EMT modelling and use in the, in the power system and for power system studies. Okay, so today uh, three things I really want to talk about. The first is the driver for using EMT modelling. Uh, so power system modelling, we'll talk a bit about synchronous generators and asynchronous generators. We'll talk about what we call RMS and EMT, and we'll talk about who in the industry should use EMT. Uh, and secondly, I want to talk about how we develop uh, PSCAD models and EMT models. So how we build the entire NEM, being the, the national electricity market in PSCAD, and how do we validate these models? And then finally, I want to talk about some of the system security assessments we do using PSCAD and EMT models. But first up, just a little background about AEMO, the company I work for. So the Australian energy market operator operates both the national electricity market and the wholesale electricity market. So the national electricity market being the NEM, that's on the east coast of Australia. And the WEM is the wholesale electricity market, which is on the west side of Australia in WA. So we work with the network service providers and participants to ensure the system is always secure. In addition, we also run the energy and ancillary service markets, which set the price of electricity every five minutes. Oh, sorry. We're a, a non-for-profit com company um, and uh, we're a joint of both government and industry agencies. So first up, what uh, are EMT models? And I guess uh, the first obvious question is what the heck does EMT stand, stand for? Well, uh, you probably guessed from the title there on the screen, EMT stands for electromagnetic transients. So what does that actually mean? So when we're looking at the power system, naturally it's good to have a model so we can you know, be able to test hypotheses, um, examine what might happen under certain scenarios. So we do what, what we call power system studies um, using models of the power system. So there are a broad range of power system studies we can do. Uh, the first and most simplest and probably what most people are familiar with is just a power flow simulation, so static simulations. So what we do is essentially we just look at one snapshot in time and we're just looking that, at that instant of time in the power system. Uh, we can model basic grid components, we can model where energy flows, what the voltage does, and we can also look at non-ideal effects on those energy flows. So this, these types of simulations really help us determine the base state of the system and can give us sort of basic technical limits of the power system. Moving on from those, we can now we can also move into transient or dynamic simulations. And why do we do these? Well, it's to understand this, how the system responds to a disturbance or a change and looking at the immediate aftermath of that disturbance. 
So we're looking at really short periods, maybe a couple of seconds up to a few minutes. Uh, and what we need to model in these simulations is just major components of the energy system that will change in response to a disturbance. So we're talking about models of generators primarily and the control systems of those generators. Um, we can do these in many different ways, but the most common probably is what we call root mean square, which is essentially a mathematical sim simpl simplification of the power system and the, just the, the, the physics and the, the mathematics which means that it can run very quickly on a computer. So it's a bit, it's a, it has some assumptions and simplifications, but it's, it's a very common method of, uh, of looking at uh, transient simulations. Extending on from RMS is EMT or electromagnetic transient types of simulations. It's, it does the same thing as RMS type simulations. We're looking at how the system will respond to a disturbance or a change over short periods, except it's done in a lot more detail. And in fact, the tools that we use, um, for example, PSCAD is, the, the, is our tool, tool of choice at AMO. It essentially means that we have no limits on what we, what we simulate in the uh, power system. We can model transients, we can model um, full transmission line models, we can model all sorts of detailed things about transformers, we can model uh, DC, um, any, any, as much detail as we want to put in the models, we can, we can use EMT for that. Which means that we, can, we have nearly every component of the energy system that changes in response to a, a disturbance and we can study detailed dynamic interactions between those components. So as I said, virtually no limitations on how much we model. The downside being, of course, is how long it takes to simulate on a computer. These are quite slow, these, these uh, simulations compared to the RMS type studies. So now let's, let's just talk for a minute. I'm just gonna step back. I'm just gonna step back for a second and, and, we, and talk about an important distinction that comes up in, in uh, electromagnetic transient modeling. So generally when we talk about generators, we talk about fossil fuels versus renewables. Say for example, a traditional generator, a coal generator, gas or a nuclear generator. Um, and when we talk about renewable, we might say a, a photovoltaic solar, wind batteries, hydro, et cetera. Uh, which we're sort of referring to the fuel type. Those That distinction becomes less important when we're talking about uh, modeling. Um, instead, what we're more interested in is synchronous generation and asynchronous generation. In other words, the type of technology we use to interface the generator to the grid. So anything that uses a synchronous generator, such as coal, gas, nuclear, solar thermal, hydroelectric, versus asynchronous, what we call asynchronous generation or inverted inverter-based resources. So these are your photovoltaics, your wind, batteries, HVT systems, statcoms, anything that that interfaces to the grid through a some sort of power electronic device. And this distinction becomes very dis, uh, important when we're talking about EMT models. So synchronous generators have large spinning masses, so they're directly electromagnetically coupled to the grid, and they respond to disturbance through their inherent characteristics. In other words, the physics of the rotors and the electromagnetic coupling. Asynchronous devices, the power electronic devices, there's basically no or direct, minimal or no direct coupling to the grid. So they respond to the grid based on how they've been programmed or how the software has been, uh, has been developed inside the inverters, which means that they can be quite unpredictable when, when um, responding to events. Now, one important thing we've been seeing in the national electricity market in the, the East Australian grid is reduction in system strength. So as these large synchronous generators are being retired and replaced with uh, asynchronous sources such as photovoltaics, we get reduced fault currents on the grid, which cause quite distorted voltages, large phase angle jumps after disturbances, um, particularly in very remote areas of the grid. 
typically where a lot of these resources, these solar and wind resources are being built. So this system strength is something that's inherently provided by synchronous generators and it was so abundant previously, it was never really valued. So with these changes and reductions in system strength, many current generation asynchronous generators, they're just not able to remain connected or have um, undesirable behaviors during sudden changes in particularly in weak areas of the grid. And this is this is where uh, electromagnetic transient models comes comes in into play. And the reason for that is because the control systems that uh, that interact on a time scale that is consistent with system strength are things like the fast converter control and the PLL or phase lock loop inside the inverters. But the thing is, these systems are simplified out in RMS type simulations, just because the bandwidth in those simulations is much slower. So to get this type of phenomena, to see this in our simulations, we need to use electromagnetic tra transient type models. So you can see here the, um, the fast converter control and the PLL operate sort of around the 100 hertz to, to one kilohertz bandwidth range which is just something that isn't modeled in RMS type simulations. So for an example of that, here is a plot, we're looking at a, an, a, an LCC HVDC link um, in Australia. So uh, we did a simulation of an event and you can see uh, on the right is megawatts and on the left is voltage. And the blue is the, the the model in in an EMT program, and the model in the the, the plot in red is in the RMS simulation. And you can see responding to the exact same event in the RMS simulation, the HVDC link rides through the event quite fine and happily. But in the EMT model, for reasons due to low system strength, um, the 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 HVDC link actually has a commutation failure. And that's something that we just can't identify with RMS. And that this is actually what happened in real life is that there was a commutation failure and the RMS model wouldn't have picked that up, but the our electromagnetic transit models did. So just to summarize all of that, why do we use electromagnetic transit models? Well, it means we can actually use the real source coding models. We can what the manufacturers will do is they'll take their uh, um, the code they use on the actual inverters out in the field, put a wrapper around it and give it to us to use in our uh, modeling programs. So we have the exact same code that it would be out in the, in the field in the actual inverters, which means we can represent basically any unknowns. We can represent the plant, we, how it would operate exactly as it, as it is in, in, the, in the real world. We can model critical stability elements, uh, particularly phenomena around low system strength. And it just gives us a more realistic uh, view of the world than RMS type simulations. That's not to say that RMS uh, EMT is better or worse than RMS. It's just a different tool that we have to solve a different problem than RMS type simulations. So who uses uh, EMT models and PS PSCAD? Uh, so uh, when we're looking at um, areas, so uh, the, the areas you would use this for is when you're connecting a new or modifying the control systems in a plant, in a generator. If you're developing system strength constraints, planning for outages on the grid, particularly in, in those weak parts of the grid with low system strength, using it for determining system strength and inertia requirements. It's very useful and, and quite critical for looking at a system uh, restart scenario, just because of the very difficult conditions um, when you're trying to restart the grid. It's uh, useful when, we're, when you're trying to do root cause analysis of an event, um, particularly if that event is due to uh, large low system strength or phenomena driven by low system strength. And it allows us to do what if scenarios. So investigate what would happen in particular scenarios. And who uses these models? Well, us, of course, the system operators, uh, the network, op the network owners will also use this software. 
developers will, will use it to do connection studies to make sure that their plant are up to scratch. Manufacturers naturally will use these models because it gives them a high, a high level of detail over their plant and of course, research institutions. Now the primary tool that, we, that uh, is used for this is a, a piece of software called PSCAD uh, that's developed by Manitoba Hydro. Uh, it has now over Australia, probably over 200 users. So before, uh, probably five years ago, that was much reduced, but uh, usage in, in these types of models has increased significantly over the last few years for a lot of the reasons I've already just talk, talked about. So 60, about a 60% increase in the last few years. So up until a few years ago, uh, EMT models were be used for very specific use cases. For example, looking at uh, lightning surges or circuit breaker switching studies, sort of types of studies that you would only need to model a very small amount of the grid for. However, what we've done at AMO is we've started to using uh, electromagnetic transient models to model essentially the entire NEM. And this uh, gives us a significant challenge because PSCAD and these EMT type softwares weren't designed to sit to you to simulate these large, <laughs> large scale grids. So how have we developed uh, essentially the, the national electricity market in an EMT program? So firstly, what we have is we have our uh, electricity management system, our EMS system. This is a system that the control room operators and the control room support staff uses to monitor the, the grid. As part of that, there is a state estimator, which allows us to take the real time skater measurements and convert it into a uh, essentially a snapshot of the grid, a mathematical snapshot, one of those load flow snapshots. That gives us a PSSE case. That's, a, that's the RMS type simulation tool. PSSE, um, we can get a case from, from that. And from that PSSE case, we can then use various tools and processes to go and create a PSCAD case based on that. And anytime we wanna change the PSCAD case, we update the PSSE case and then update that the PSCAD case from that. In parallel to that, we also get all the models of generators as part of our uh, connection process. We get all the PSCAD models of the generators, uh, 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 tax device models, statcoms, uh, HVDC links, et cetera. We get all those part of their connection process and we connect those to the, grid, to the model we've already developed. And again, as I said, those are highly detailed model, highly confidential models as well that just contain very large amounts of details of those plants. Now I mentioned before what uh, that the main disadvantage of electromagnetic transit models is that they're incredibly slow and computationally intensive. So before, um, before essentially this year actually, we've been we've been using version four of PSCAD, and what our model consisted of is 180 generator models running in parallel. Where as far as we're aware, that's the largest model in use anywhere in the world having 180 generator models all running in parallel is, is, is quite, quite a, a remarkable feat, uh, especially since, since you realize that all of those generator models are running at between two and 50 uh, micro, microsecond time steps. So incredibly detailed time steps. Um, the com computation requirements for that was we actually needed three separate computers, three massive computers with 14 cores, huge amounts of computational power to run this. And even then, it would still take four hours to simulate just 30 seconds. So very, very slow running just because of the huge amount of detail in these, those models. Quite recently in 2022, that's changed. We've actually upgraded our model to now use PSCAD version five. And that has given us a lot of benefits. The main one particularly being we can use a single computer with 64 cores. It's an absolute beast of machine, but it allows us to run the entire NEM in one hour and 45 minutes. So that same 30 seconds is in a one hour and 45 minutes, which is becoming more and more critical if we need to provide real time advice to the control room, do these sort of studies in near real time and provide advice to the control room. And that graph there just shows the progression of how many buses we've simulated over the years, starting back in 2016 after the South Australian system black, 
going from uh, about 600 buses in South Australia all the way to now where we're simulating over 3,000 buses. And the simulation time is in the red there as well. So it, it used to take more than a day and it's now come down to an hour and 45 minutes. So we've had quite a lot of optimization in that time. Now, how do we validate these models? So this is the one place in power system engineering that we like system disturbances. And we always like systems testing, testing, of course. So what would happen is if there was an event, we would go to all of the participants and the network providers, and we would ask them for high-speed data of the events. And that high-speed data allows us to do individual generator model validation and also system-wide validation. Essentially, what we would do is we'd get the the, the high-speed data of a generator at its connection point, the active power flow and the voltage and the frequency, we would inject that back into the PSCAD model, uh, a single machine infinite bus of that generator model, and we, we essentially what we call playback that voltage and phase angle into the model. And then we look at the response from the model, we look at the response from the real-time data and compare the two. And if they match, we usually say with a plus or minus 10%, then we can say that that model is 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 reasonable reasonable and it, it re gives a reasonable uh, outcome uh, in, in comparison to real life. Then what we can do is we can do system wide valid validation where we if we have a disturbance with lots of high speed data, we can set up our PSCAD model to be identical to that condition to the conditions right before that event, then run the exact same event in PSCAD, monitor what happens to all the generators, line flows, um, et cetera, and then compare all of their responses to the real-time response, uh, the, the actual event response that happens. And we're doing this on a continuous basis just to make sure that our PSCAD model is always the latest and up-to-date and we, where we have confidence in the results that our models are giving us. So we can also do system testing where we actually plan a test, say for example, plan tripping a transmission line, we can we can look at uh, the high speed data from that. Here is an example that we have looking at subsynchronous oscillations, uh, where we, we've done an event with trip to transmission line, and we've observed these uh, subsynchronous oscillations in voltage, both in the PSCAD and the uh, and the um, real life measurements. So again, this gives us confidence in that the models are telling us giving us a reasonable, reasonable result. So now that we've got these models, what do we do with them? Okay, so let's let's talk a bit about how we would use these models in real in real life. So the main thing, or the first the first and the main thing that we use these models for, is system strength requirements and inertia re requirements. So essentially, we're looking at what's the minimum number of synchronous generators we can get away with before we start to see issues on the grid. Uh, and we do we usually do this on a per a region by region basis. And we consider things like transmission line outages and, and uh, load flow and, and what's happening else is happening on the grid to, to give just a like exact for example a minimum number of synchronous generators for system strength. And we've done these studies for all five regions on the east coast of Australia. So this this helps us give advice to the control room to say, well, we need to keep at least a minimum number of synchronous generators on at all times. And for regions that have a, a large, a large, um, a large demand, this isn't usually so much of an issue. But for places like South Australia, and now starting to be the f uh, far north Queensland, it's becoming an increasing challenge to to manage low numbers of synchronous generators online, and managing that that minimum level of um, of sync system strength and inertia as well. What else do we use it for? Well, we look at fault level shortfalls and remediations. So for example, there's, there's been quite recently a, a shortfall in system strength in South Australia. And to, to remediate that, we've had to go and install synchronous condensers. So to gain confidence that the syn synchronous condensers are doing their job and they're remediating the, the system strength, we can do these simulations in PSCAD and show that they've fixed, they've fixed the problem. Another area that we've we've used PSCAD for is looking at voltage oscillations in the West Murray area. The West Murray area is a region in 
northern Victoria, which is made up of, it's, it's very electrically very distant from any synchronous generators, but there's a very large amount of uh, solar and wind farms in that area. So we're having a lot of uh, system strength instability issues in that area. So with our PSCAD model, we've been able to look at the issues that we're having in that area and then go and tune all of the solar farms in that area to prevent any issues that are happening in that, in that area. We can also use it to sort of predict where we would need to put synchronous condensers, their size and location, just to optimize and get the most benefit out of those installations. And now we're starting to look at that same sort of issue in far north Queensland, where we're getting very remote from any synchronous generation sources, but there's a high level of solar plants being installed in that area. And then finally, there's a, uh, special applications of using this model. For example, looking at when South Australia is in an extended island situation where the interconnector to Victoria has tripped. And now South Australia is a very small island with very low numbers of synchronous generators. It's quite unstable. And the PSCAD model is able to help us determine what the limits are in that kind of condition. We also use it for looking at design of, in, of uh, special protection schemes. In particular, uh, we've been reviewing uh, the special uh, the special projection scheme that's been developed for South Australia, the System Integrity Projection Scheme, or SIPS. So being able to look at that benchmark and make sure it's doing its job. So just to summarise what I've talked about, so we have a need for electromagnetic transient models to represent the high frequency switching behaviour inside the, the, the inverters in the, the, the inverter-based resources, so the, the fast current control and the, the phase lock loop control systems, and also the unknown unknowns that are sort of embedded in the, the programming of those systems that you just wouldn't see in an RMS type simulation. We're able to predict these challenges before they occur. Now we've used these EMT models in Australia for a wide range of operational and planning studies. And we've had quite a lot of key learnings about network equivalencing and the size of wide area models, particularly how we size our computers and try and get the get the fastest runtime out of these models. And it's quite the the, the space of wide area EMT modeling is very new and it's ever, it's ever evolving. As I said before, before this year even, we weren't able to simulate the full grid in under four hours. So it's it's constantly changing and ever evolving. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, thank you very much for that, James. Very, very interesting and, um, yeah, obviously quite a growing area of knowledge and expertise um, given, I guess, as you said, some of the historical challenges with compute on compute power. It looks like there's plenty of opportunity to explore in that space. Um, Roisin, are you, are you online, able, able to unmute now and, and good to go? Yep, I'm ready to go. Great. Um, yeah, so hello, thank you so much for having me speak to you today about the challenges for electric vehicle charging in the UK. Um, as I said before, my name is Roisin Hickey, I'm an Assistant Technical Specialist uh, in the Infrastructure Strategy Team at Senex. Um, I should probably start with a little bit about Senex. Um, we were founded 15 years ago as the UK's first centre of excellence for low carbon and fuel cell technologies. We're independent uh, and a non-profit consultancy and, and research organisation for low carbon transport technology and uh, all associated energy infrastructure. Um, we work on all kinds of projects in this area, so we help companies electrify their fleets, uh, we support local authorities um, with EV and infrastructure strategy, that's an area I work in quite a lot, and uh, we're also involved with big uh, government funded innovative uh, research projects on new technologies amongst many other things. Um, we're mainly based in Loughborough, which if you don't know is a town in the East Midlands of England, but uh, we also have an office in Edinburgh, Amsterdam and partner offices in South Korea as well. Um, and we also organise two big industry events, which is Senex LCB and Senex CAM, bringing together people from across uh, the industry to present and discuss 
emerging technologies and the future of low carbon vehicles and connected and autonomous mobility um, that happens in September. So if you're interested in what I'm talking about today, that might be a good event to, um, to come along to. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of the context. I'm sure many of you don't need to be told about why we need to decarbonise transport, but um, you may or may not be aware that the UK has a legally binding obligation to reach net zero by 2050. Um, and that was backed up uh, by the UK Parliament declaring a climate change emergency. And since then, uh, that happened in 2019, over 300 local authorities um, in the UK have declared a climate emergency. Actually, in 2019, in the UK, road transport uh, caused around 25% of the country's carbon emissions. Um, so tackling the decarbonisation of uh, road transport is a huge challenge and it will have a significant impact. Um, if we wind back the clock a few years, there were plans to um, ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2040. And these plans were then consulted on and brought forward uh, initially to 2035, which is then been brought forward again to 2030 for the ban of new petrol and diesel vehicles, uh, new petrol and diesel cars, um, with sales of new plug-in hybrid cars um, being banned from 2035. Uh, it's not just carbon emissions that are driving this move away from petrol and diesel vehicles. Uh, those of you based in the UK may have been impacted by the fuel shortage, panic, whatever it was a few months ago. Uh, cars queuing down the road with the hope of finding a pump that wasn't empty. Um, and EV drivers were driving around feeling very smug with themselves during that time. Uh, air pollution is another uh, huge driver. Uh, just last week uh, in London, I think maybe still this week, uh, they've been told not to exercise outdoors. Elderly people with lung conditions and asthma and other health conditions were advised uh, not to leave the house if they didn't have to because of the extreme levels of air pollution in the city. So there's a real swing towards EVs undoubtedly and the implication of what that means for the overall vehicle park. Um, so that is all the vehicles on the UK's roads um, are really significant. So this graph takes into consideration that initial 2040 ban scenario, um, looking at the proportion of uh, new vehicle sales and the total vehicle park that are EVs. Uh, we can see here by, by 2040, around 60% of cars and vans on the road are projected to be EVs. And as the more stringent vans uh, come into place, that increases. Um, until we get to the state that we're looking at today with the 2030 ban in the purple here. Um, so 100% of new vehicle sales, that's the dashed line at the top, will be electric as of, uh, of new car sales will be electric as of 2030. And then uh, following that, 90% of all vehicles might be electric by 2040 in the complete vehicle park. And the red dots on the graph here at the bottom indicate um, the proportion of the vehicle park and the proportion of new sales that were EVs in 2021, I think they're September 2021 values. Um, so the total vehicle park maybe looks a bit lower than where we expect to be, but the um, new vehicle sales are actually uh, sort of exceeding what we're expecting. Um, and in fact, despite last year new car registrations being much lower overall, um, more electric vehicles are registered in that year than the previous five years combined. Um, so the market is accelerating uh, in response to this, this policy. And this obviously has um, an impact on the infrastructure required. So all of these electric vehicles are going to need somewhere to charge at the end of the day. Um, so at the end of September 2021, just under 29,000 connectors were registered on the National Charge Point Registry, um, which is annex and um, we actually run for the government. Uh, and if we look forward and project under that 2030 ban scenario, um, a massive increase in public charging is needed. So here we've run one of our models that takes that EV car and van uh, projected uptake and translates it into uh, the required infrastructure. Um, so with this 2030 ban, uh, we might need 165,000 public charge points by 2025, over 400,000 by 2030, and potentially over half a million 
um, by that 2040 date. And this does vary by geography, uh, by demography, by land tenure, it's not going to be distributed evenly all over the country. Um, for example, uh, if you're in a residential area where there's lots of off-street parking and people can charge at home, um, that public infrastructure is not as needed. But if you're maybe in a more urban area where you might have terraced houses or lots of apartment blocks where people can't gain access to home charging, that's where that public charging will need to be focused. And just to note that uh, I was just talking about cars and vans there, and that's before even heavier vehicles uh, are considered. So uh, this picture is a newly constructed HGV charging facility, I think in the west of the USA. I can't remember where I got the picture from now. Um, but of course, that's a huge amount of infrastructure on top of what we've already spoken about. Um, if those bigger, heavier vehicles switch to EV um, as well. So including private charging in this, uh, the impact on the grid could be significant. Uh, this graph is from the National Grid Future Energy Scenarios published in 2021, the first document. Um, so we can see with unconstrained EV charging, so that, that dotted line at the top, there's a possible increase in peak demand. I think this is based on a winter peak demand um, of over 20 gigawatts based um, compared to that 2015, 2020 baseline. That can be controlled. There are mechanisms for that, obviously, uh, for example, through smart charging. So that would be controlling the time and power of that charging. If you look at the dashed line now, that uh, reduces this increase to around 10 gigawatts. Uh, we could even take that smart charging one step further and use a uh, bi-directional vehicle to grid or V2G charging. If you've not heard of that before, uh, it started in Japan as, as, sort of as a response to the Fukushima nuclear disaster. A sort of an alternative backup um, power because it allows uh, stationary plugged in EV batteries to act as energy storage assets so they can charge and discharge in response to uh, demands on the grid. Uh, we've been involved with quite a few sort of government funded research and development projects to do with vehicle grid over the past few years um, in both domestic and commercial settings, looking at what the value is for the end user. What the likely payback period will be uh, for installing a VTG unit, so quite pricey at the moment. Um, which balancing mechanisms will be the best to use alongside it? Uh, if you're interested in more about that, we uh, published a white paper last year that's available on our website um, for the serious project, which is in the domestic setting, and that's really interesting if you wanted to check that out. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that not all vehicles are VTG enabled. Uh, currently only available through one type of charger, which is the one that uh, Nissan uses. Um, uh, the other common charger, that co charger connector type, uh, won't be V2G enabled until around 2025, I think. So it's a technology still in its early days, and while there's, there's been some really interesting developments and analysis come from these projects, it's by no means certain that this reduction that we see on the V2G line um, can be achieved. Uh, so the question I'm going to take you through now is what's the roadmap and how do we get from where we are now to where we've got this projected massive increase in the number of EVs and the infrastructure required to support it and that the sort of implications that might have. So I've got three kind of milestone markers on this roadmap um, looking at the current status and what we believe are the well solved areas and ready for rollout today, looking at the, the current innovations that are being worked on. And finally, in the distance there, looking at the current barriers, where a lot more focus will be needed to ensure that this future becomes more of a reality. Um, so firstly, the current status at the moment, uh, around 80% of charging is done at home, as most of these sort of early EV adopters tend to be wealthier and they're more likely to have a house with a driveway and so can install a home charge point uh, connected to their domestic power supply. And why wouldn't you? It's a really cheap and convenient way to fuel a vehicle. You don't have to um, nip to the petrol station on your way to work in the morning. Uh, when you wake up, uh, it's fully charged, hopefully. Uh, and there are also good support mechanisms uh, in place to buy the vehicle and install that home charge point uh, with government grants in, in both those cases. Uh, nearly as well developed as this is rapid charging. So there's a growing network of 50 kilowatt, 150 kilowatt, sometimes even more 
um, charges across the strategic road network, those motorways and major roads, um, serving those sort of on route on longer journeys. And it may not be completely perfect right now. Uh, it's an area set to expand significantly, uh, an example of which is GridServe, um, who are developing a network of all electric forecourts along motorways and uh, major roads in the UK. Uh, and this picture in the corner shows the first of those, which is opened in uh, 2020 near Braintree in Essex. So you can see all the charge points um, down here, a uh, full hub of them with the solar canopy, I think potentially some battery storage in the background there, and it provides all sort of um, services and amenities over here. So uh, yeah, full solution there, all good stuff, no major barriers. Uh, similarly, destination charging is all provided for. Uh, it's not unusual these days in the UK to find a charge point in car parks at supermarkets, retail parks, leisure centres, tourist destinations, um, even McDonald's and KFC have got uh, uh, programmes in place to install charge points in their car parks. So it's not an area that requires significant work. And at this point, it just needs um, delivery as the final step. As we move further down the road, there are some areas that require a bit further innovation where the, the problems are not quite solved, but the solutions are in view there. Um, so across the country, lots of companies are beginning to look at their fleets and considering what it would be like to, uh, what it would look like to switch to electric vehicles. Um, not only do they have to consider whether there are suitable electric, electric alternatives to complete their operations, so that are those suitable electric vehicles actually available that will um, match the vehicles that they're currently used to, they also have to obviously review that infrastructure aspect. So where would their vehicles charge? Are they high mileage and they need to make sure they charge en route throughout the day? Um, do the employees take their vehicles homes? They have to consider installing charge points at employees' homes. Do they have enough capacity at the depot to install sufficient charging power for their vehicles? And if not, how much would they have to pay for a power supply upgrade? Or what control options are there to reduce those peaks in charging and make sure that when they come to work in the morning, their vehicles have enough charge to complete their daily operations. Uh, the big challenge is that many depots weren't built to have this level of demand on site. So there's all warehouses or their office buildings, and they weren't provided with that sort of electricity supply to charge tens or even hundreds of vehicles in some cases. Uh, I've worked with some companies who've made a pledge to uh, electrify their fleet by a certain date, but then they don't necessarily know where all the vehicles park overnight so that's the first hurdle to overcome is um figuring out where those vehicles were overnight so that we could tell them which sites were the most appropriate to install infrastructure at uh, there are a range of um solutions coming out on the market but yeah we definitely encourage those fleet managers to consider the full picture of electrification so that they're ready for that switch and choosing the most suitable option and there's also a lot of innovation going on for those I mentioned before aren't able to install a charge point at home um, in the, the this public residential category. Um, there are lots of innovative uh, technologies coming through, uh, which should pop on the screen now, including chargers that can pop up from the ground so they're completely invisible when not in use. Uh, Low-lying charge points that reduce that visual impact on the streetscape. Not everyone wants a big um, pillar charge point outside their house. Uh, chargers that you can plug into the ground um, and a more one that you might have seen more in the UK is uh, lamppost charge points. So yeah, the, the, these are some really interesting innovations, but they do come with their um, certain challenges that they have to overcome. So is that technology mature enough for deployment? Uh, are people at risk of tripping over these, the low lying ones, such as the, uh, the connected curb armadillo charge point in the middle there? Uh, what happens if someone parks their car on the curb over your pop-up charge point and you can't actually use it um, and how do residents access those charge points and are they truly public lots of residents will want um, a charge point outside their house where they can park and it's solely for their use but is it truly public in that in that sense a bit further along the roadmap is rapid charging hubs so having multiple rapid chargers of different charging powers in one place in sort of in contrast to the motorway service station uh, model that we saw before. It's more of a bespoke hub looking to serve maybe the local area rather than just those um, transiting through. 
the work here is more to do with whether there's a good enough business model, a business case, and if you can get the, the significant utilisation to make that a worthwhile investment. Um, coming at this from sort of a, a slightly different angle, there's a bit more work required to make sure that more rural communities are able to access EV charging. So in this case, often the technology is there, but the rural communities can get left behind. Uh, for example, they might be similar to the public residential issue. They're older dwellings that might not have been built with a driveway, so it's difficult for them to uh, connect a charge point to their home power supply. Um, at Senex, we've been working with a community group in an area of Elpa in Derbyshire, um, to the town, and this the area we're looking at here, the Belper Clusters, um, is a World Heritage Site. Um, and there's been lots of uh, challenges to do with um, the conservation and the planning aspect of this, um, while still being able to provide infrastructure for these local residents. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to um, install here. You can't just plonk a charge point on the curbside in quite the same way as you might be able to in an urban environment. It needs to be um, sensitive to the surroundings. And the distribution network can also be constrained uh, in more rural areas, so they're less prepared for that increase in demand that, that charging EVs will place on it. And finally on this section is interoperability. So this is a topic that the government is currently uh, really interested in and consulting on. Um, currently, if you're an EV owner and you want to charge in public, you have to carry around uh, a plethora of RFID cards and download several different apps just to be able to access those charge points because they're run by all different um, charge point network operators. And, and while that the ability to roam from network to network is sort of beginning to come into place, it can still be difficult and confusing. And there's a lot of work here to improve uh, the user experience, make switching to EV uh, a more attractive option for drivers. Um, to add a bit more about the customer experience side here, We've done some work over the past year or so to determine what improvements um, could be made in this space. Uh, many people have said that they want their public EV charging experience to be exactly the same as their current uh, refueling experience at a petrol station. So they want to be able to pull up to a charge point and not have to wait for very long. Um, they want to be able to plug in without having to wait. Um, yeah, plug in without having to wait start trying start the charge in one standard way so they don't have to search for their app search for their card and um, have the charging tariff really easy to see and understand whether that's per kilowatt hour per minute uh, is there a connecting charge uh, be able to pay in the same way at the end so using contactless or uh, even paying in cash for some people uh, so that standardization and, and interoperability could really persuade some people um, to make that switch. Uh, so lastly, we come to what we consider the current barriers, where there's a lot more work needed to unlock the problems on the roadmap into the future. Uh, firstly, at the moment, if you're a tenant or a leaseholder, it's very difficult to install an EV charge point on the property. You'll need the permission of the building owner or landowner and in commercial settings that can also be difficult if you've got shared car parks and the companies in there you've got to you know get involved with the, the highways authorities and uh, there's a lot of um hoops to jump through so if a company wants to go green they may find it a lot more diff a lot more difficult if they don't own the building that they operate out of um it's actually it's great to see that government grants are starting to open up to tenants so at the moment you have to own have private off-street parking in order to access a home uh, charging grant, um, but it is starting to open up for tenants, um, but there's still some standardisation needed and they do still have to get the, the landowner permission. Um, so yeah, there's still a bit more work to be done so that they can, so everyone can access that, that infrastructure they require. Equally, um, accessibility for disabled EV users needs to be addressed. Um, uh, the government is working on this with Motability, who represent and advocate for better access to transport for uh, disabled people. Um, so currently, I think the development of the public charging network is still in that sort of infancy, infancy phase. We're still in the position where we can make these, these differences now and have an accessible network from the beginning and not 
as an afterthought. So it can be in some other places. So for example, we need to make sure the charging bays are wide enough for wheelchair users to access the charge point. You need to have cables that are an accessible height and they're also not too heavy to handle um, so that no one is excluded from using the network. Oh, I didn't mean to click happen. <laughs> Thirdly, we have the strategic placement of charges. Uh, this is an area I work in quite a lot. Getting the right number and type of charge in the right place um, is certainly something that local authorities will need to take a role in, um, mainly in the planning and coordinating, in some cases in the delivery of them. But they need that support in making sure that this is done strategically so that people are being served by the right infrastructure um, and that is actually being well used. So there are sort of proper tools and insight needed here to make sure the right choices are being made and best practices shared across the country. And there's also that communication between the policymakers and those who will be operating the networks, make sure it's a really cohesive process. Um, it's also important to have uh, really good communication with their relevant uh, distribution network operators so that know where in their jurisdiction there is the current capacity and headroom to install charge points and which locations are more constrained so they can prepare sort of in advance for any distribution network works and upgrades they might need um, in order to provide this uh, these charge points for everyone and the cost as well of this um, that might inhibit the deployment of charges. And if this data were easily available and accessible and in a standard format across all uh, the DNO, DNO operate, operating areas, it will make the, that transition so much easier. Um, this job for local authorities is likely to be huge over the coming years. Um, it tends to be at the moment a side job for officers working for the authorities. It might be part of the neighbourhood team, part of the roads team, part of the energy team. And in reality, considering the scale of what needs to be installed, um, it might become a full time position required in the future. Uh, On to the the charging equity point, uh, as I've said before, early adopters of EVs tend to be more affluent. They've got the capital to spend on an EV um, and they have the means to be able to charge cheaply at home because they can install their home charge point. Um, it's so statistically more likely that those who don't have their own driveway or private charging or private parking are less affluent. So not only are they less likely to be able to buy, an EV and benefit from the lower cost of ownership that, off that offers from um, with the low maintenance and low fueling and operating costs. They're also going to have to depend on the, even if they can buy an EV, they're going to have to depend on the public charging network, uh, which can be several times more expensive than charging at home. Uh, there's a lot of work being done to make sure that this is, there's an equitable charging system and that this transition is just so that we can decarbonise transport without excluding those who might struggle to, the most to access it. And uh, the heavy vehicle challenge was mentioned earlier, it's much easier to solve these issues for cars and vans, but as, as vehicles get heavier and travel longer distances and require bigger batteries um, that would take much larger, uh, to take much longer to recharge, where are the most useful locations to install this infrastructure? Um, is there the capacity at those locations? What does that infrastructure look like? And even is battery electric the most suitable alternative or is this where hydrogen fueled vehicles uh, get their moment to shine, which is a whole different topic entirely. Um, so I hope that's given you a bit more of insight into where the barriers and challenges lie along the roadmap for EV charging in the UK and a lot of these points could be applied internationally. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening and be interested to hear your, your thoughts and comments and questions that have come up. Yeah, thank you very much, Rasheen. Two, two very interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentations with slightly different flavours. Um, Ash, if you're good to, to take over the questions, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, sure. It's uh, a few different questions have come in, so it'll be good. I'll start off with you, James. So. One of the questions is, do you think um, you'll be looking downstream or quote unquote downstream? So do you model in rooftop PV generation as well? Um, and the response of that uh, going off or coming on, as well as do you do battery packs like um, Tesla, say 50 kilowatt inverters in your EMTP modeling? 
Yep, sure. So our current model at the moment, uh, it models down to the sub-transmission level. So we're only really looking down to the bulk supply points. Um, the exceptions, of course, being where there's embedded uh, light grid scale generation. So anything, say, 20 or so megawatt more or megawatts will, will, um, will model down to. Um, that said, we do do studies to analyse the, the effect of rooftop solar. It just means we have to model them in a different way. And there's a few ways we can model um, rooftop solar. Um, one way being just, just to model um, a, a reduction or, or an increase in demand um, manually after a response and seeing how the, 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 the system responds. But uh, one thing that we have been developing and we are developing um, quite recently is what we call the DER model or distributed energy resources model, which is essentially a, an aggregate model of solar rooftop PV placed at the connection point. And that those models uh, would allow us to model the effects of, of solar PV inverters, sort of like an aggregated response to solar PV inverters. So that's something that's very, very new and something that we haven't really looked at a lot in EMT type models, but it's something that we're increasingly doing, going to have to do a lot more of. Sure, thanks for that. Um, Roisin, I'll throw one to you. Do you think customers are likely to support uh, vehicle to grid given the potential impact on battery aging slash capacity? And also what do you think about um, the role of aggregators in the vehicle to grid market? Is there a domestic uh, participant market out there? Yes, so the the impact on the battery that the vehicle to grid has is one of those big questions that these trials has, has tried to answer. Um, I think from the results, particularly of the, the Cyrus project that I mentioned, is that um, people were actually, um, their, ex their expectations were exceeded at the end of the trial by the effect that it has on the, their battery. Um, there's lots of different reports saying that it will destroy your battery capacity and its, uh, and its life, but um, there's equally many reports saying that it it's only sort of reduces that by maybe one or two percent, and even some that say that it can um, improve um, the battery. So uh, I think it's positive, but there's obviously still a lot of work to be done in that area. Um, what's the second question about aggregators there? Yeah, so the question was, um, currently, is there a domestic um, participants, can they access this market, yeah. um, you know, off vehicle to grid services? Um, so it's not that available for the public yet. Most of it has been done through uh, trials. Um, it, it's mainly sort of the, uh, your energy uh, supplier that will provide this kind of um, service. Um, in, it's in sort of an individual's perspective, it's more likely to be vehicle to home that you would maybe be able to take access of. Um, so maybe integrating your vehicle with, if you have, say have solar panels at home so that you can um, maybe during the middle of the day while your car is, if you're working from home, plugged in and your solar panels are generating a lot, well, as much as they can in the UK in the middle of the day, um, you'd be able to store that, uh, that electricity in your car battery and then be able to use it um, later in the day, um, oscillating between charging and discharging. Um, so I think that's more where on the individual level where that would that would apply. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, James, um, have you had any interesting findings uh, or just learnings from this whole of network EMTB modeling? Um, and also just do you always have to simulate the whole network uh, or can you actually break it up into smaller sections, um, you know, sub regions or groups if you just want a quicker result? Yeah, we have found a lot of uh, a lot of uh, learnings, particularly around the more we start to model of the grid, the more issues we start to see pop up, um, which is just uh, a consequence of modeling the grid in, in greater and greater detail. Um, as for the, um, can you model the, the grid in smaller sections? Yes, and in fact, that's exactly what we do. What we would do is if we're 
only looking at an area of concern um, for particular studies, we would model just to say, for example, that uh, generator and the, in the the region that that, that generator is in, mm -hmm. and then we would create an equivalence of the rest of the network. And this, that the majority of our studies would be done in that way to save, you know, simulation time um, yeah. and and resources. However, that said, um, there is an increasing need to model the full system, and and particularly in the Australian system. And the reason for that is in Australia we have quite uh, dominant, or at least on sorry, on the East Coast Australia power system, we have quite dominant dominant inter area um, phenomena, particularly inter area oscillations. And what we've been finding, um, and part of a driver for doing the entire NEM in EMT rather than just region by region, is that we're starting to see that, well, one, as synchronous generators are decommissioned, these into area modes of oscillations, which are largely damped by synchronous generators, um, they're starting to become more prominent. And we're also starting to see things like large so large wind farms can start to contribute to those into area modes of oscillation. So if we just equivalence out the rest of the network, then some of those phenomena are just hidden and not visible. Yeah. We just um, we just can't see those. The other reason being, of course, is when we do create an equivalence, it's, it's the equivalent point essentially acts as a, well, it has a lot of assumptions around it. It, it, acts, it, acts, it acts as a as, as an infinite source um, at that point. Um, so any anything that happens near that point is, is going to be unreliable. So you have to, the more, more you want to, to model the further and further away, you have to move that point. So it ends, ends up being question like, is it, is it worth um, managing the consequences of of using that equivalence method mm. and the uncertainties it introduces? For one one particular example being, would, if you're trying to study a frequency event, you would have to use the full grid because an equivalence was essentially just keep on injecting power until frequency was back to 50 hertz. You, you can't do any sort of frequency-based studies using that. Yeah, sure. Sounds like obviously the wider area you have, the probably the more appropriate, but you got to weigh it up against, um, yeah, computational effort and time. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, Roshin, a bit, bit of a technical one. So, um, if we've sort of um, think about mainland Europe having much more three phase power, um, are there any plans to deploy this more in UK homes? Um, the context being, um, if someone wants to install a 7.2 kilowatt charger on residential premises, um, are there currently any issues um, or is that um, on the radar of being uh, resolved if there are? Yeah, so um, I think seven kilowatt chargers rely on single phase power, um, but it certainly is a bigger sort of power demand from your your domestic uh, power supply there. Um, I think often they aren't needed. If you're at home, you tend to be plugged in and charge for a long time. So you don't necessarily need faster and faster uh, charging domestically. Um, I think that's our general consensus is there's no need to sort of go faster and faster in the domestic setting because um, they're designed to sort of, your car's gonna be sat there for the whole time. You might as well um, use that, that form of charging. Sure. Um, James, back to you. So quick question on, there was a question on whether AMO has any um, Syncon sizing and location reports out there at the moment. Yeah, sure. There's a couple of um, reports you can look at on if you go to our website. The first being the integrated system plan. That's the plan, we, uh, the, the report we do every couple of years to plan um, out for the next 10, 20 years uh, of the power system. Uh, and that includes chapters on looking at things like system strength and inertia. The second one you would want to look at is the renewable integration study. So that does also contains a lot of information about where we're going when it comes to things like system strength um, and inertia. More specifically on synchronous condensers, if you want to know more about um, the synchronous condensers, I'd suggest going to the Electronet website. Electronet is the uh, network service provider in South Australia, uh, and they have quite a few good reports on um, this on system strength and the system st strength economic evaluation 
um, when they did the uh, the investment testing for installing the synchronous condensers there. So I, I'd suggest, yeah, going to the Electronet website and and look and doing a search for synchronous condensers. Excellent. Thank you. That sounds like a few different resources uh, that the participant can jump on. Uh, Rasheen, so we've heard like um, just I guess part of the zeitgeist is that if you install more charging infrastructure, people will accelerate the uptake of EVs, but is there any actual evidence to support this? Is there any actual reporting that's been done to validate this assumption? And the second question is, I guess, um, if we do see that happening, that people do end up buying more and more EVs with, uh, as the charging infrastructure comes in, is there um, any thoughts on you know, socializing the cost of installing the charging network? Um, yes, yeah, so it's certainly our belief that you need to have the infrastructure in place in order to get people um, to switch to EVs. Um, there's actually a lot of, sort of maybe more anecdotal evidence about this. Um, we did a, a big survey, uh, I think, last year, all the years merging into one when you're working from home, um, <laughs> about what what barriers are in place sort of on the personal level for people. And a lot of people are saying that they just they don't see that that public charging network. Uh, available when they're driving around, they see the uh, fuel station, but the yeah, the 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 charging infrastructure, they just don't notice it or they don't see it, and they think, why why would I switch to that when there's not not enough to, uh, to support me? So really, um, having that infrastructure in place and making it really visible and obvious, and you know, informing people of where it is and how they use it, um, I think will have um, yeah that help towards that swing to EV. Um, uh, I think the comment about uh, socialising the cost is interesting, definitely in terms of public residential charging, it will need to come, that installation is likely to come from um, the local authority, so it will be public um, money in that case, uh, mainly because the business case is quite poor for uh, a, a network operator to want to invest in that. Um, if you're installing public residential charging it's likely to be sort of that three to seven kilowatt and um, more likely to be seven kilowatt um charge points and they can only really be used once a day because it will take eight hours for um a car to charge fully um on that sort of infrastructure uh, and a network operator is just not going to get the profit that they could from in installing say a faster charger a 22 kilowatt or even a rapid charger um so in that case definitely um it's going to rely on that sort of uh, that public investment rather than private. Yeah, excellent. Well, this is actually a very interesting question and uh, I think you've responded to pretty well. So I'm in very of time here. We've probably just got a couple of minutes before I wrap up. So James, last one for you. Do you think uh, EMT modeling is likely to be replicated in other uh, parts of the world, like the UK, for instance, or um, Europe in general? Or do you think it's specific to the way the Australian grid um, is um, you know being such a skinny and long grid and that it was mostly re a requirement here and may see very little benefit in other parts of the world. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, very good question. Um, and as you say, yes, it is. It has been uh, part of the uh, the characteristics of the Australian grid that has driven the need for these kinds of studies, being that it's very long, skinny, low, low not amounts of synchronous generation and lots of inverter-based resources. However, it is inevitable for all, all, basically everywhere in the world that this is gonna have to happen just because of the way the grid is changing. And it's it's the fact that we've sort of reached that point before anyone else. Um, we've reached that sort of tipping point where suddenly um, we're just getting so much inverter-based resources that, that we, we need um, a better modeling tool to be able to handle the um, the implications. And, and to that, um, we, uh, yet the the next probably on the list is 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 NERC have actually just come, been coming up with that exact same um, question and if you if you look at their recent uh, uh, Odessa disturbance report one of the key findings from that is that they need better electromagnetic transient modeling of their their, their systems so so it, it it's just a matter of time before other jurisdictions start to um, use these same um, these same approaches just because of the characteristics of their grid 
haven't haven't reached the levels of penetration that we have here, but it will be inevitable. Yeah, sure. This is NERC in the US, I'm assuming? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, James and Roisin. That was um, that was really, really interesting. And I uh, can't thank you enough for the time and effort that you have put in in sharing um, your experiences today with um, the NGN team. I've just um, screen shared um, your emails up there, so I know I did not get through all the questions. So feel free. James and Roisin have agreed that they are um, willing to answer your questions and maybe you want to shoot through to them. Um, and there is also Seagrays, Australia's and UK reps um, email addresses on there as well. If you had any specific questions regarding uh, joining the org organizations and um, as usual, the final plug is about upcoming events. Um, NGN UK are doing one uh, in collaboration with the France NGN. Um, and so that's happening uh, uh, next week. And then we'll have in Australian side, we'll have future events posted on their website as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around um, and uh, taking the time out.